Let us pray. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for this day that you've given us to be together. We thank you for the privilege of worship in which we can come together with brothers and sisters in Christ, knowing that as we gather in your name, there you are in the midst of us. We ask that you will bless this time we have together so that we may leave this place strengthened as your disciples to be a blessing for the world. And in the moments to come, may the words which are spoken and the thoughts and the meditations in each and every heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Many years ago, I was a, a dean at a camp at Lakeshore, and they had just put in their high ropes course, and I had been looking forward to being on that high ropes course. And uh, if you've ever been to Lakeshore, perhaps you've seen it, but it's, it's a course set up in the midst of the trees, about 15 to 20 feet off of the ground, and, and you climb up into the trees through a through a rope ladder, and then you're, you're hooked in. You're, there's a cable that runs above all of the different obstacles. And, and on that cable is, a, is, is a, a harness to which you are hooked. And no matter what you do, there is no way, there's no way that you're going to fall. But the thing is, is that as you walk around this obstacle course, you don't necessarily feel that connection to that wire that's above you. So it's, it's very easy, very quickly, to forget that you're hooked in. I was doing great. I was doing great. Went through the different obstacles, and each one of them was, was challenging in its own way, but each had something in common. There was something that you could reach out and your body could touch or you could reach out and grab a rope or something like that until you came to this one place. And I was so proud of myself. All the kids were down there watching and I was doing great. I was, I was doing really good. I was proud of myself. Until I got to a log that went from here to there. Just all I had to do was walk from here to there. And I started out, and there was nothing to touch. And I felt my balance doing this. And just for a moment, you're not quite sure if you're connected. And suddenly, just for a moment, your mind starts playing tricks with you. And you wonder, am I up here all by myself? Because if I slip off, that's 15 to 20 feet. I can get hurt. Now. I was keenly aware of everybody watching. And I was becoming more and more embarrassed as I froze and couldn't walk another step. The counselors called up, Tim, just walk, just go. It doesn't matter if you fall, just go, just go. And I said, I understand that up here. It's in here that I don't quite comprehend it yet. And so I took a step and I took a step and sure enough, I lost my balance. Off I went and within a couple of inches, the rope caught. And there I was hanging by the wood and everybody was laughing. And I stepped back on the log and in no time at all, I walked right across because then I knew, I knew that the rope had me. Today in the scripture, Jacob had an experience that made him recognize God's presence had him when he didn't expect it. And it changed the way that Jacob began to go about his life as he began to trust in God and less in himself. Now let's set the scene for the story today. Last week, we talked about the story of how Jacob got Esau to sell his birthright 
for a bowl of soup and how Esau despised his birthright and Jacob wanted it. After that took place, there was another story prior to what we heard today. Jacob's mother put Jacob up to tricking Isaac into giving his blessing to Jacob that was supposed to go to Esau. And so Esau found out about it. And he was very angry. And he decided in his anger that he swore he was going to kill his brother Jacob. Jacob's mother told Jacob to flee from Esau's anger by going to where her family lived. But to Isaac, to her husband, she told him that Jacob needed to go to her family in order to find a wife because the Bible tells us she and Isaac certainly didn't like those two Hittite wives of Esau. So, what's described in Genesis is a controlling, conniving mother. A weak and easy manipulated father. A first son with an explosive anger and no regard for his birthright and a second child willing to deceive and lie and who's running scared for his life. That's the setting. That's the setting where God's plan is at stake. We live in a world that seems very chaotic, and at times it is very chaotic, and it is in that chaos, it is in the strife, it is in the struggle that we face each and every day where God's presence finds itself and God's plan finds itself. Jacob set off for his relative's home. For the first time, he's on his own. And he stops at a place to rest for the night. And while he slept, he had a dream. A dream in which a, a stairway or a ladder, it's, it's unclear with the word that's used, a, a stairway or a ladder that reached from heaven to earth was visible with angels ascending and descending on it. God suddenly in this dream spoke directly to Jacob and promised that the promise to Abraham and Isaac were going to be continued in his life. That he was going to be blessed in order to be a blessing. Jacob woke up and, and took the rock that he had used to prop it up, up his head and and set it up as a pillar, and he poured oil on it to consecrate it, and he named this place Bethel, which means God's place. Perhaps Jacob learned what the psalmist would later say, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. And in that dream, heaven met earth. The ladder went from heaven to the heart of Jacob, and he became a changed person. And we see God acting in this moment. And as we do, perhaps we can learn a little how God acts today, because God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the Scripture tells us. Hearts change when heaven meets earth. God's grace often happens in a person's heart. We often wonder why God doesn't change the world, but God does change the world most of the time, one heart at a time. We often think about the world being changed in a whole, but we ought to be thinking about the world being changed one heart at a time. When one heart is changed, when one soul is saved, one mind is renewed, one spirit is opened. Marriages are strengthened. Families find peace. Friendships are renewed. Struggles find resolution. In the midst of this world of turmoil, look at finding love and joy and peace in your heart. And you'll find it when you, got, when you discover that God reaches into your life when God's heaven meets your earth, just like Jacob. 
And maybe like Jacob, we'll realize when we recognize God's grace in our life, maybe we'll recognize like Jacob that the ladder, the stairway in Jacob's dream was a symbol of God's entering into this world, not our exiting. In Jacob's dream, he saw this ladder with the angels ascending and descending, and then all of a sudden in the dream, God was beside him, speaking to him. Now, in a few moments at the conclusion of our service, we're going to sing that old spiritual, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. But that's not the the full story. Because this text today is not a story about Jacob climbing that ladder without at least first God coming down that ladder. Any climbing that we do in faith is only after God's coming down. It's only in response to God coming first into our lives. Consider that Jacob was running away from his problems at home, but God entered the scene. And that ladder is a sign of God's entering. God doesn't offer Jacob the ladder as a way to exit. The ladder is a sign of God's entry and promised blessing in the midst of the problems, in the midst of the struggle. Have you ever felt alone? You ever had those days where you just felt all alone? And have you ever had that moment when suddenly you had somebody that you trusted and loved there with you at just the right moment? You remember how that felt? to have that presence? Have you ever known God's presence in that way that you've known someone else's? When you know that presence in your life, you know that's enough. I have an understanding of God's presence in, in my life I can't remember a time when I didn't. And I'm blessed. I'm very lucky. But that sense of God's presence was because I belonged to a family that was present. And that family was present to itself. And that family belonged to church. And and that family talked about God. And that family prayed. And that family read the Bible. And that family extended to my grandparents and my uncles and aunts and my my grandfather and my mother. I remember driving in the car with them and hearing them harmonize as they sang hymns in the car. And that helped shape my life. And I can remember as a kid of seven years old walking out of a church service telling God I would do whatever God wanted me to do just in the same way that I feel like I'm talking to you now. It just seemed natural because that's the way life was. I understood God's presence and the presence of the love that surrounded me. And every time you or I or we as a church or we as families and we as part of the community extend that love to other people, they begin to understand Christ inside of you and Christ inside of me that is that presence in this world. That presence makes a difference because when you experience that presence of God, you know it's enough. And so God was present. That that ladder was God's entry, not Jacob's exit. And God also spoke in a way that Jacob understood. You know, God often comes to us in ways we understand. Jacob was in a trying time in his life, searching for what was important, coming to grips in the midst of fear and loneliness. And he discovered that God was present as he slept, as he had a time of rest, as he had a time away from all the craziness back home. Think about other stories in the scripture of how God came to somebody. 
When Jesus spoke to people in Galilee, which is plush and fertile, he would speak about the birds and the lilies. Consider the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. When he spoke to people in Judea, he didn't talk about birds of the air and lilies of the field because there were nothing but rocks and ravens. And so he spoke to them and said, if the people were silent, the rocks would cry out. He spoke in ways they could understand. When Christ appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, Saul was knocked to the ground and blinded. Somebody like Saul had to have their attention. Something Saul could understand since he was in the midst of persecuting other people. Most often, God speaks to us in ways that we're ready to receive if we're paying attention. Never underestimate when God might speak to you in a very simple way through your spouse or your child or your friend or a stranger or in the beauty of a sunset or in the approach of a storm or in a song and you hear a lyric at just the right moment or in his holy scripture, or in someone that needs assistance, or in a moment of prayer. For Jacob, it was in a dream when heaven met earth. And that leads us to one other thing I want to share about God's presence. Heaven ultimately meets earth in Jesus Christ. In today's gospel lesson, Jesus met Nathanael. Jesus called Nathanael an Israelite. Here's an Israelite without any guile, Jesus said. It's the only time Jesus is quoted as using that word, Israelite. Israel was the name that God gave to Jacob. Jacob dreamt that he saw this stairway or this ladder going to heaven with angels ascending and descending on the ladder. And Jacob, who became Israel, said, this is the very place of God. In the words just after what was read today in the gospel, Jesus told Nathanael that I saw you sitting under a fig tree. Nathanael said, you saw me? under the fig tree, and he began to worship him. And Jesus said, you're amazed that I saw you under the fig tree? And he said to him, very truly, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened, and you will see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus to Nathaniel and to the others was saying, I am the ladder. I'm the ladder in Jacob's dream. I'm the way to heaven. I'm the way to the Father. I'm the way God comes into this world and I'm the way to the Father. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise that God made in Jacob's dream. Even though Jacob had acted in ways that he shouldn't have acted, the plan was for his benefit and indeed for the entire world's benefit. And even though the world may have turned away from the promises of the Lord, and even though we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, nonetheless, the promise of God will be fulfilled one way or the other. The Bible says, Therefore God has also exalted him and given him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jacob was transformed by God's promise. And he responded by promising God to give him his life, his trust, his hope, his goods. His pillow became a pillar and that which was simple became holy. The rock, the place, in Jacob's life. All were transformed by a promise.
through the grace of God when God descended into Jacob's life and spoke to him as he could understand and kept his promise. At Lakeshore, when I learned to trust that rope that had me, I became a lot bolder. Jacob became a better person when he realized that God was there. Let me ask you today, has heaven, has heaven met earth in your heart? Has God descended into your life? Trust in God today. For in Jesus Christ, he is closer than you might think. Let him into your heart. And watch how God transforms your life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On page 418 is our final hymn. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. As we sing, let us remember that it is only in response to God coming to us first in Jesus Christ that we can talk of climbing in faith with God's, with God's grace. And so as we sing, let it be a prayer of hope that we, that, we, that we pray as we sing and let it be in response to God's love our Stephen minister this morning is Walter Krug, who will be to my left and to your right. If anyone needs to have any conversation or prayer following the service and any conversation and prayers with Stephen ministers are kept in the strictest confidence, shall we stand as we sing?